from NPR Music. You're connected to All Songs Considered. I'm Bob Boylan. I'm here with Robin Hilton. On this edition of All Songs Considered, Robin and I have a conversation with Beck. A lot's happened since Beck released his last full-length studio album about five and a half years ago. He's suffered and since recovered from a back injury that made it difficult for him to even hold a guitar. He recorded a new album, shelved the whole thing, and launched several other projects online, including an art gallery, mixtapes of his favorite songs, and Record Club, a series of cover albums performed by Beck and his friends. There was also 2012 Song Reader, an album's worth of new songs Beck released as sheet music for others to perform and record. Morning Phase is Beck's new record, and it comes out February 25th. Do you think it's it feels like morning to you? It certainly... Yeah, I didn't intend it. I, when we were in the studio, we were doing all the strings. We actually did them at Capitol. So it's in, fortuitous. In Los Angeles? But, yeah. yeah, and uh, they have these studios down in the basement of that famous Capitol building where they... Frank Sinatra and all these classic records were made. We were just creating some fragments because I wanted to have... I always have extra pieces. There's about... I think when you hear a final record, like a record like this, you hear about 20% of the actual <laughs> music that was made. And so there's there's so many little pieces, and I think at the last minute I have one of these fragments. And I, had, I know I had about four or five of them, and I just tried sticking them in different places. You, so it it wasn't really thought out. It was kind of a something a piece that just fell into place. It's like oh that works. A lot you, of times it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, you throw pieces you, eighty percent of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, Most you, of the time it doesn't. You you mentioned the the lyrical process and how some people are hearing these sort of California the Pacific Ocean kind of themes in the music and that it wasn't necessarily mm-hmm. intentional. Do you find that you approach this music you really didn't have any agenda and you more discover the songs yeah i had that song wave that's something i recorded about five years ago and i tried to give it to a few other people so i just had that song sitting around for a long time and i played it for people and i always had this got this reaction and so i started to put together songs that felt like they could go with that song and build them around that so that was kind of that was always the center of the record and and then I had some of these Nashville songs to add a little bit of lightness. And the record's pretty slow. I think, I think at one point we realized it was nothing faster than 60 BPMs, <laughs> which it's half a dance per minute. Yeah, right, right. That's that's really slow. Your your average dance song is 120. So yeah. this is yeah. I yeah. think to, a hit song has to be right. 120 something. So BPMs, someone is so. going to double speed your record. You know that. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> you you could have a hit on your hands. <laughs> I have actually was told that if I, if I just put a beat here. David, Richard Campbell, you know rather well, <laughs> worked on the strings. Yeah. How, how do you work together? Well, your dad. Well, I mean, each song's different. That one in particular, I had the song written, and then I usually get some kind of keyboard, and I'll play the basic voicings. and we'll Can I be really geeky and specific when you say written? How are we mm-hmm. talking here? Are we talking about on uh, score, on paper? Are we talking about in your head? You know, it used to always be in my head, and then there was a certain point where I st- had to put them on tapes so I can rem- remember them. Mm-hmm. Age? Uh, voicemail. <laughs> I'll, put them, I'll put them on a computer or whatever is handy, and then bring the basic form and structure. And With strings, a lot, a lot of times I'll play or sing parts over it that will transcribe. That's actually what happens a lot. It's a song called on Sea Change called Paper Tiger, and there's a whole solo that the orchestra does. And that was actually uh, something I sang, and then we just transcribed it. Oh, cool. And the transcription, when you say this, we, are you talking your dad would transcribe it in in that case? Yeah, and there's also other people he works with. And then in this case, so you brought this in some form of recording and then how did the orchestration come to be it's funny listening to it the vocal got so loud mm-hmm. like uh, after mixing and mastering the vocal was always tucked in this sort of huge orchestra so the vocals are just... <laughs> you actually sound like god <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's supposed to be tucked in there but i don't know I, it had a lot of power i'm just gonna say listen mm-hmm. to it this morning it, it was pretty good that was a tricky one because you don't you don't want to get in the way of the orchestra at the same time you know you want to well, actually a lot of these songs on this record it was like how do you keep this mood and then not sing on it and disrupt it or break the spell of whatever's happening with the music really uh tricky on a lot of these songs so you you approach that a couple of different ways i mean in this case your voice is very big 
Yeah. Um, well, not intentionally, but um, yeah, and some of them it's singing soft, singing higher, trying different voices. Mm -hmm. I had songs where I'd try singing it 20 different ways. I mean, just beating it into the ground and then you finally find something okay this feels like it's part of the song and I've heard other singers who are more you know proper trained singers they have certain voices that they'll just use they just know that works mm -hmm. whereas I kind of have to feel my way through it a bit but you're not on train I mean you, you have this in you I'm like, believe like, me I'm really on train <laughs> I need fool, some training fool me <laughs> I'm making it up as I go really it must be a constant voice in your head I, I just think of you as being so prolific and I, I was joking with Bob before doing this interview I was just scrolling through my my library and thinking hmm. has this guy written a bad song I've got like 200 songs <laughs> 200 yeah, songs there's here yeah there's some there's some bad ones and then yeah, I thought for sure you, you have so, to write the bad ones you know there you go to get to a decent one you really do I really believe in that I kind of wish there was more room for people to make bad records and just make a couple of bad ones you know to get to the to the good stuff it's part of the process do you still do that now do you still find that uh, you oh, yeah, run and yeah. throw it away and start over yeah a lot so how do you get past that voice that tells you wow this one's crap you know I, it's hard I think I had a lot of years where I, that was really hard and I was f talking to a friend about this a while ago sort of the rise of internet and all the the blogs and the sort of internet criticism I think I think it's affected a lot of musicians there's sort of this critical voice in their head and I think we're all getting used to it now. I think there's something happening in the last few years. I might I might be just talking out of my neck, but I think there is something. Uh, it's like somebody's pointed uh, a camera or a mirror at you, and you're a little more self-conscious. And I don't know. I I feel like I've felt it in music over the last ten, twelve years. Do you mean more introspective, or just a little bit more? Oh, if I do this, then it's going to be this or yeah, that. Yeah. You know, where I really when I started out, I mean, you were just throwing stuff out there. You had no idea what people thought I mean there'd be a couple of record reviews but you really were completely uh, ignorant of and, and unaware of what people actually thought unless you were at a show mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know you could play a song and people didn't like it that, that happened plenty of times has anything yeah. ever you've ever done made you want to just give up making music I've been encouraged to give it up <laughs> many times. <laughs> Name <laughs> names. <laughs> well, you know, I had a really early experience. What I lived in New York in the '80s, and uh, there was a, a small folk scene, just probably the last gasp, the last strands of a village, East Village folk scene happening. You know, left over from the '60s and '70s, and I I got to uh, go play music for. Uh, one of the members of the Weavers. We're talking today, this morning, uh, Pete Seeger passed away. Ye oh, I didn't know that. Oh, my gosh. Oh, gosh. Wow. Did that happen today? Yeah. Uh, last and, night. Oh, wow. At 94. So Pete wow. Seeger, for those who don't know, uh, at 94 years old, was a main figure in, in folk music and so much political movement and everything, but he was in the yeah, Weavers, yeah. right? And the Weavers were one of the only, were one of, exactly. were one of the few folk groups that sold records in the 50s. I mean, they they put yeah. folk on the map and pop music. So anyway. Yeah, and a, and a time that was that not uh, friendly to... Uh, <laughs> That's right, because of the politics. Know, what of, they were singing about. That's so, right. yeah, they uh, popularized uh, a lot of the folk music and along with Woody Guthrie pro probably planted the seeds for the folk revival. Right which leads to the singer-songwriter. And, and Woody and Pete used to travel around the country together. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I was pretty steeped in all that. As, as a kid, I read all those books and learned a lot of the songs. And you know, that's what I started out really drawn to. I got to play for one of the members of the Weavers, and I remember, <laughs> I remember getting... Uh, yeah, you ever thought of going back to school? You know, that's kind of <laughs> <laughs> He said, look... Don't give up your whatever day job yeah, you don't said, have. Look, Look, it's, it's nice that you're doing this, but I really don't think it's a good idea for you to play music. I mean, I would not put... And I'm, I, at the time, you know, I really didn't have How old? ambitions or hopes. I was just doing it because, uh, you know, I liked playing music. And I, I was drawn to folk music because it was something you could just kind of do. It wasn't... You didn't have to be trained or groomed, you know. It, growing up in, you know, that particular period... It, in uh, or coming of age in the, the 80s the superstar acts that the artists who were popular were kind of superhuman it was like how do you do that you know yeah. you were how I mean, old then 
uh, oh, probably 18, uh-huh. I think. So what made you yeah. basically say to that person who said to you, <laughs> you got to go back to school, what made you say, I've got something? Well, you know, again, I was, I, that wasn't really what I was, I wasn't there for that. I was just there to, to meet him and, and to uh, say hello. I wasn't there to, you know, <laughs> get you were, his permission you, you had to play asked, music. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, and the, for so many years, I didn't, I, I played music with no encouragement. I just did it for, you know, because the like-minded people were down at, you know, whatever bar or coffee house, you know, whether it was the Chameleon or ABC No Rio in New York or Al's Bar or Raji's in L.A. And yeah, I, I went, to, while we were working on the record, I went down to see him and Chick Corea play acoustic one night at the jazz club. Stanley Clark, a great bass player for those who don't know, know, yeah. don't know from... Return to Forever would be uh, one. Yeah, and his solo records. I mean, killer. I, I don't know if you've seen some of his the, the album covers for the solo records too, or some of my favorites. Yeah, and he had like a whole Prince period, which is really interesting. Seemed like a, an odd match, although, uh, yeah, he seemed like an odd match. To well, me. I don't know if you've seen those acoustic shows, but it's just, I recommend it. Like even if you're not a fan of jazz, or it's sort of jaw drop dropping. Huh. I would see that. It's like okay, that's this is another category of musician he used to play with that other yeah. Beck guy the, uh, the the Jeff Beck yeah. guy Mr. Stanley Clark did yeah that's right um but he's you know one of these as a musician a monster <laughs> 